Hello and welcome everyone to yet another episode, episode number 10 of Yell It! Yell It! Yell It! Yell It! Yell It! Yell It from the Mountain! Yell It from the Mountain, Artist in Conversation. Today, uh, with a very, very wonderful guest. I'm very excited. I'm, um, I think I feel honored that uh, she took time to be here today. Uh, there's a list of things that I connect to her. I think she's very intelligent. She's high in demand, insightful, challenging. Um, to me, she's a trailblazer. Uh, there's a lot of adjectives uh, that I could continue saying. Uh, very inspiring artist, Natasha Kelly. What is on the other side of Corona? What will the new normal look like? Will it continue to be determined by racism, sexism, and heteronormativity? Or will we be able to create a world order critical of intersectional power? Ein Dokumentarfilm, in dem ich acht schwarze Künstlerinnen verschiedener Generationen, äh, verschiedener Kunstsparten interviewt habe, um zu wissen, inwieweit ihre Erfahrungen als schwarze Frauen in der weißen Mehrheitsgesellschaft ihre Kunst geprägt hat oder eben selbst von der Kunst geprägt wurde und zeige somit auf die Kontinuität schwarzer deutscher Geschichte bzw. die Kontinuität oder die Entwicklung von des schwarzen Feminismus und schwarzer Frauen im deutschen Kontext. Leute, weltweit gab es massig Demos der Black Lives Matter Bewegung. wo beispielsweise Menschen in Zoos gestellt wurden. So wie du in den Zoo gehst und dir die Zebras und Löwen und alles anguckst, da standen wir. Mm -hmm. What is Afrofuturism 2.0? Oh, Afrofuturism 2.0 <coughs> is a manifestation of a body of systematic thought that African Americans were promoting in the 20th century. However, it was primarily an American-centric way of talking about black speculative thought. Wow. Hey. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, it is a very special show on different levels. One, uh, you are fluent in German and you're fluent in English. And this is the first time in, uh, in Yell It Dead, an artist that is mainly working in Germany uh, is going to speak English in Yell It, uh, you're the first artist who I asked, which language do you want to talk today? So this is very interesting and I'm really excited about it because uh, a lot of Canadian artists uh, might get to know you for the first time, but in Germany, you're like, you're a celebrity. <laughs> and so it's really, really cool. Uh, that's one thing. Also, this is a special edition of Goethe Institute Toronto and Goethe Institute Montreal. Uh, one of four special editions in this uh, second um, season of Yell It. So I'm sitting here in uh, Goethe Institute Toronto, downtown Toronto on University Street. Uh, I'm wearing a dark blue turtleneck uh, sweater. I have my hair wavy today. I'm, I have um, white AirPods in my ear and dark blue lipstick. And behind me, there is the installation in the stacks by Thomas Dunier. And uh, yeah, it's actually the Humboldt University Library, but that's an installation right now in Toronto that you can check out uh, online at the moment. How about you? Okay, I'm sitting in my living room in Berlin Kreuzberg. I live in Kreuzberg. Um, I'm on my sofa surrounded by cushions. There's a picture in the background. I have my, I'm wearing my hair open today. I have a full fro, an afro. I have big earrings, which actually say afro on the earrings as well. And I'm wearing a woolen um, pullover um, with um, stripes, because it's cold and this is kind of like cuddly. I don't even know what that word is. <laughs> <laughs> cozy, it's cozy. Cozy, cozy. So um, yeah, so I'm, um, that's kind of like, 
And I have lipstick not as nice as yours. I'm, I'm wearing a dark red to fit my nails, but um, I love your lipstick, by the way. Side note. Thank you. Did you bring a drink today? I did. I am actually drinking uh, ginger, orange, and honey tea, a mixture mm. to fit the weather, to fit my coziness on the couch. Yes. Similarly, I uh, brought uh, a chai latte, fitting the weather, the coziness. Uh, so cheers to you. And yes. welcome once again. Uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and what do you do? I'm Natasha Kelly. I'm actually Dr. Natasha Kelly, but I only like using my title when I'm in academic spaces, actually. So I have a PhD in communication studies and sociology. Um, I'm an author. Um, my uh, sixth book, I think it's six or seven, I don't even know, is in the making. Um, I'm a curator. I'm an artist, um, a filmmaker, um, theater, play writer, and director. That's just about it. That's just about it. Like <laughs> maybe you out there have an idea what I mean. Uh, the complexity of this woman is most inspiring. So what is making you laugh these days? The person that definitely makes me laugh the most is my daughter. She has a sense of humor that when she cracks her jokes, it goes like straight down into the bottom of the belly where this huge laugh comes out. What is a person that currently inspires you? I think um, somebody um, on an academic level who has been my mentor for the past over 10 years now is definitely Professor Dr. Ronaldo Anderson from um, Harris Stowe State University in St. Louis in the USA. Um, I don't know um, how aware you are of the academic situation here in Germany, but um, I grew up in Germany. I went to school in Germany. I studied in Germany, but I've never had a black teacher in all of my life. So I think this is a position that um, when I got to meet him like over 10 years ago at a conference that I participated in, he has become my teacher and mentor since then. And he is definitely somebody who inspires me a lot on a cognitive level and brings me, pushes me to the border of Euro or beyond the border of Eurocentric thinking. What is the best advice that you have ever received? The best advice that I've ever ex perceived was actually um, during the phase of writing my dissertation, where my supervisor, he, he's not a man of many words, but when he says something, then it's always on point. And what he told me back then was, Natasha, learn to keep your emotional distance. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, it took me a long time to really understand what he meant. And today, I would say it has become my mantra. Because I work with very sensitive topics around racism, sexism, intersectionality, um, and especially Black German history, which is my own history, I've um, profited from these words many times, keeping emotional control of the work that I do. And this is an advice, advice that I would always pass on. Uh, you have become a real spokesperson, especially this year, but not only this year, only in like in the last several years for, um, for the black community, actually, you know, to speak on all kinds of issues like that um, concern racism, that concern diversity, that um, concern intersectional feminism, but your background is in, you studied uh, communications and uh, sociology. That's where you did your PhD in. And then now you are also working as an artist, like not just in a few ways, but in many ways. So can you please describe um, your development or your way from the academia 
to becoming an artist. Can you please explain how did it start? How did that happen? What was your entry point into the artistic field? Dealing with phenomena like racism, sexism, intersectionality, um, it also, it, it became um, a multi-linear topic. So um, this is one of the, the, the steps going beyond Eurocentrism that like thinking of something that starts somewhere and ends somewhere. This whole power matrix opened. And um, so for me, it was, it was impossible only just to um, stick to this Eurocentric linearity because it was not possible for me anyway, as a black feminist, it's not possible to do academic work without the practical work. Um, so um, it was just a matter of time of also including my theory into practical work, so to say the other way around. And um, that's, that's how it all started when I was in um, um, over 10 years ago, I was teaching a course on post-colonialism at the Humboldt University here in Berlin. And I was trying to figure out a way to make this untouchable phenomenon, racism, touchable and more understandable for my students. And that was possible through the arts. That's when I practically started my first art project, the supermarket, Edeva, where we, um, where I, I, I um, my, my, my students were challenged to create a supermarket project that doesn't use stereotypes, where you can see what the background of the, the company is and um, to bring in literally an artwork. And then people started coming and they just started growing and it grew into a real supermarket with shelves and these virtual products that we had, well, not virtual, but placebo product, pro, uh, products. And um, we were touring with this supermarket for eight years. I can absolutely relate to that because I also have an academic background and then later on joined the arts. I feel like in the arts, I have more freedom to choose from different resources and different languages that I came across in my culture, in, in my normal life. Is that something you would agree on or do you see it differently? 100%, I totally agree. Um, what I would add to that is literally that um, here in Germany, they're also not ready for black um, academics. You know? They're not ready for our perspective of the world. So this made working in academia even more complicated um, to describe what you, you, you call freedom in that sense is really to say that it was a, wasn't only a creative freedom because for me, I cannot separate my theoretical work from my practical work. For me, I'm, and, and this is maybe why I, I do so many different things, is that I'm, it, it, it offered me a different channel to communicate. I always channel Black German history in different ways, reaching different audiences with the same content. To, to use Du Bois's words, art is propaganda and ever will be. Yeah, and um, although you have, like, especially white cis men, who think that they're not political in their art, they are. There is no art that is not political. And I think we have to get beyond this thinking in boxes. It's Absolutely. doesn't make sense anyway. Uh, another project is Millie's Awakening, which was released in 2018, Millie's Erwachen in German, a documentary where you interviewed different black artists. I wanted to know how how was that birthed, uh, the idea for um, Millie's Awakening? And if it was a similar um, desire of hearing those voices? First of all, I have to say that it was, uh, I was invited by the 10th Berlin Biennial to do something. I think the, the most important point, it was that Biennial was an all black curatorial team. Or the idea for the content practically came after one of my theater shows I have a, a, a theater series called um, My Sister, dedicated to my Ayim, um, Afro-German poet, and one of the pioneers of the Black German community. And after one of these, these shows, um, an elder sister from the audience came down. We were still on stage and we were full of adrenaline and, you know, we were happy, the show went well, da-da-da. And then she came over and she said, 
yeah, can I talk to you? It's this really quiet personality. And all of a sudden, all of us were quiet. She said, um, that day, the morning, we were in the newspaper, in, in the Tats, German newspaper, right? But this newspaper article for the first time was a full spread written by a black journalist, black female journalist, black woman, with an interview with me as a black woman, talking about an elder sister as a black woman, no? And she noticed this and she was like, this is the first time that I've ever seen this in a daily paper, a full spread, three black women in focus, talking to each other, communicating them on these levels. And then she said, it was really great, but she said, there was one thing that you missed. And I was like, damn, you know, I'm so ambitious. Like, how can I miss something? <laughs> and then she was like, yeah, you missed to talk about our generation, you know? And I was like, your generation? And she was like in her mid sixties. And she said to me, yeah, before the eighties, when Maya Yim was around, before Audre Lorde had come to Berlin, there was already a black women's organization and a black women's movement. And all of us, we just really stopped and we listened. And then we listened to her story. And she told us about her story in the late sixties and early seventies, how she came to Berlin and be living in Berlin as a black woman. And it then soon showed that these two decades are, are literally a gap in documentation. So we have a lot about the um, after the post-war period and then it stops and then it starts in the eighties again to this present day. So the film, after talking to her, for me, it was, the story was so interesting that I wanted to do um, something about these two decades, the 60s and 70s, Black Germany, what was happening, yeah? And then um, I started to look for other people like her. I started with her story. She started telling me her story and she actually then became one of the protagonists in the film. I wouldn't say that I deliberately set out to say, oh, I need to make a space for Black women to speak, da da da, because uh, that's what I do anyway. But um, I think what was more um, provoking for me was actually to share the space that was offered to me at the Biennial. And this was a way that I could do it, to bringing all these eight um, female artists together and sharing the idea of what even does art mean to us. I think that it, it just came out really nice. I think that is, that is really, really important. And um, so thank you for creating that work. I chose uh, to also talk about Comet. Uh, the Comet, a book you uh, currently released, and um, you can now order it here. Uh, there will be, uh, this is Natasha's email address, so you can order it directly. Before I ask this question, do you want to give us a little introduction about the book so people know what we're talking about? First of all, I need to say the Comet is actually also bilingual because we just now touched on that. Um, yeah, so it's great. English and German. This is like really important for, for this whole project also. And it's the um, result of a symposium that I curated two years ago at the Hau Hebelam Ufer Theater here in Berlin on Afrofuturism 2.0 in cooperation with the BZAM movement, the Black Speculative Arts Movement, which I've been a part of for several years as well. The BZAM movement is an international Black arts movement that deals with Afrofuturism, but in an Afrofuturism 2.0 context. And the 2.0 is really important about this because um, with the 2.0, we literally reclaimed Afrofuturism which um, throughout the past decades has, like everything else that Black people do, been whitewashed um, um, and reduced to um, what it actually is not. So um, in the, in, I would say it's, it's a tool of freeing our mind, of actually creating visions of what the future for Black people might even look like, yeah? And um, when I did this symposium two years ago, it was important for me to really reintroduce this idea because when it um, arrived in Germany in the, um, in the 90s around um, that time, it was more like an underground movement, I would say, um, in the community. So there, there were different individuals dealing with it. But I think um, B 
being whitewashed like everything gets whitewashed before it reaches Germany. If it's blues, if it's jazz, if it's hip hop, if it's it don't really matter. Everything <laughs> that's great. Then, exactly. Yeah. Know, exactly. So literally, it was um, Afrofuturism um, was reduced to the idea of um, Sun Ra, reduced to the idea of jazz. But the whole political idea that was is inside Sun Ra's work um, of freeing black people um, from a mental slavery, uh, be human slavery, and 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 see um, racism in, at the end of the line. It was not really transported. It became like this pop cultural thing, yeah. Um, and I wanted to, um, I wanted to reintroduce it on the new level that it it, it is now operating on, um, where you cannot dis disconnect Afrofuturism, for example, from social movements. You cannot disconnect it from philosophy. You cannot disconnect it from academia. You cannot di disconnect it from economy. From from everything actually. And um, it was back in, in, two, in 2018, that was the 150th anniversary of W.E.B. Du Bois, who is my academic hero, by the way. He also studied in Germany, Du Bois, what a lot of people don't know. He actually studied here in Berlin and his um, first anti-racist ideas were actually created here in Berlin. And this was also like the second thing that I wanted to introduce to people, because I was like, no, nah, you're acting like no black people were around to create knowledge in this country. We've been here forever. Yeah, say the same things to you that we've been saying for 100 years. So in this symposium, it was a combination of art, uh, visual art, digital arts, performance, discourse, lecture, and it was a three-day um, three event. And I had invited different, um, different scholars, artists, etc. And for me, it was important to document this, yeah, because um, that's also something that we tend to forget is to document our shit, you yeah? know? Especially keeping the 60s and 70s in mind where we're literally missing information about our community. For me, all the work I do, I document it. I want I want the afterworld to know what's going on today. So that's why I've got so many books, yeah? So it's practically a documentation of this symposium. But then through Corona and everything that was going on this year, the whole concept took a different spin. Yeah, because it's called the Comet, um, I'm named after one of W.E.B. Du Bois' first short stories. And he was actually a pioneer of Afrofuturism. This is also important to know. Back at that time, the, 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 the word Afrofuturism didn't, didn't exist, but what he was doing was Afrofuturistic. Yeah. So in this short story, um, which he wrote exactly 100 years ago in 1920, a, bomb, uh, a comet drops on New York, destroys New York. There are two survivors, a black man and a white woman who go seeking other survivors. They find um, a group of white people who belong to the family of the white woman who want to lynch Jim, his name is, lynch Jim, yeah? So what's the moral, cut a long story short. The moral of the story is a comet can drop on this planet, yeah? It can be a bomb, it can be anything. It will not destroy the um, power structures, racism, sexism, or any other ism. If we want to destroy that, we have to destroy it ourselves. We have to deconstruct it. So while um, Du Bois is writing, we have uh, the last pandemic going on, and also what you call the Red Summer, which was a season of um, racist terror, black people going on the street and fighting for their rights, you know, came out of the last pandemic. And seeing what happened um, this year with Corona and the Black Lives Matter movement, it was history repeating itself. So um, on the launch of the book, I had um, a second exhibition because there's a lot of artwork in the book, especially also art by Quentin Vazetti, who's up in Canada um, with Tell you, us. one of the BZ members. Yes. Shout out. Oh. Yes. Hi, <laughs> Quentin. And tell us a little bit about this project. That's one of my questions. Um, Quinton is an artist also in many ways, yeah, and he works with um, augmented realities and uh, he 
actually do similar work. I think she he's working to actually put focus on um, the erasation. Is that a word like that? Um, Erasure. Thank you. Erasure <laughs> of uh, blackness in Canada, and that is a uh, a lot you talk about too. And um, through yeah, so that's academia. that's the, yeah, that's literally where our works connect. Um, or we use different tools. I'm not not very familiar with this augmented reality, but um, what is what we both have in common? I think is about making black histories visible, but not from the perspective of the victim or somebody who was stolen from somewhere, but really from the subject position of us being kings and queens. And this again is where Afrofuturism comes in. This is actually a tool of Afrofuturism, going back into the past and recreating future ideas, um, rethinking how events could have taken place in the past and where it would lead us today or in a hundred years again from now. So this is a very Afrofuturistic approach, which we have in common. And I think living in white majority societies, uh, especially Germany is um, also, we have a lot of work to do to make um, it's, um, our realities visible um, and also um, not as something that is, you know, intruding from the outside. This is this is how we're often perceived here in Germany. Oh, they're migrating, blah, 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 they're invading us or something, but actually um, doing the work from the inside and showing that we are actually also German and very much so, <laughs> especially when I go abroad, people really see how German I am, just being in Germany, you're everything else but German. So this is where our, our works um, connect, I think. It connects on the Pan-African philosophy that you know the, the, the diaspora as a whole um, belongs to the continent. We're, we're, we're brethren, so to say, family. And, um, and through the love of art, I think, or the, or the arts. Thank Quinton. you. Yes, yeah, shout out to Quinton. Uh, that's, by, uh, by the way, another Goethe Institute Toronto uh, project. He's a Montreal-based artist. And uh, yeah, it's part of the uh, series Reshaping Past and Future. Uh, recently, and probably you've been saying that for years, but I, I, I think I saw... Um, uh, an episode on the the young channel of Bayerische Rundfunk. You uh, basically went around uh, and showed the interviewer different um, colonial historical um, places in Berlin. People who studied it know that has been happening for all this time, but I think it was really enlightening for a lot of people who haven't dealt with black history. And my, uh, I think you also said that, um, yeah, black, black history uh, has been basically erased uh, over the years. And now we talked about Afrofuturism. How does that actually connect to the future? I think there are different approaches. There is one approach that you can really go into the future, looking at future as a linear time, for example, and go into the future and really imagine what the world in 100 years from now might look like. I think that would be like a classical, very Eurocentric understanding of Afrofuturism. But I think that um, Afrofuturism is more than that. If you look at Afrofuturism from an Afrocentric perspective, Time is circular. There is no beginning and no end of time. So if you look at it more from that, set, that point of perspective, Afrofuturism can do a lot of different things. You can, you can, like I said, go into the future and imagine a future, but you can also go into the past and imagine past futures. Yeah. For example, what did our foremothers and fathers, what did they dream of? We, for example, we are their vision. We are their vision that has become reality. They dreamed of their black children going to school, learning to read and write, um, surviving in, in this space where we were never meant to survive in the first place. So we are, we are also a vision. So that's also a very Afrofuturistic 
way of looking at self also yeah that i could i wouldn't be here if they didn't do what they did when they did it yeah and at the same time um i also owe I owe it to them. I owe them new futures and I owe it to them to carry their idea of future into the future because we still haven't reached there yet. Yeah, we're still working on it. We're still fighting the system 500 years later. I mean, we're in a different space than we were 500 years ago, but we definitely have not reached our goal. You know, Afrofuturism is a, um, at the same time a lens, a way to look at something but it's also a, a methodology, a way to do something. So these are two different things what I would say are inseparable from the Afrofuturist movement as we live it today. So the lens and the methodology both in itself is also dynamic, if I understand. Exactly. It's not yeah. stagnant. And last project I want to talk to you about um, is Afrokulturen. I don't know if you just uh, translated Afrocultures. Uh, which Afroculture is, in English, yeah. And the idea to develop that into a theater play um, was uh, happened uh, in while you were in Brazil, and you were uh, there also with the residency of the Goethe, Goethe Institute. Institute. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, this, if I uh, understand correctly, was supposed to be staged this year at the Düsseldorfer Schauspielhaus, but due to current theaters closing, uh, it will be postponed. Tell us a little bit more about that project. Mm -hmm. Well, it is actually um, the um, restaging of my dissertation. Afrocultural was my dissertation, um, with, where I look at the biographies of um, W.E.B. Du Bois, Audre Lorde and Maya Yim. And I show that black knowledge has always been produced in Germany throughout history but has never been institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And then I show why it hasn't been institutionalized. I give different examples on different levels. But this was like so highly theoretical. And I don't want to, you know, pat on my own shoulder, but it really is an important book considering what is going on here right now, especially in Germany. I'm like, people, why are you not reading my book? <laughs> because, <laughs> I, no, because I'm like, wait a minute, we've done that. 10 years I ago, why, why, are, why are we even having that conversation, yeah? Preach! I wanted to reach more people, but more people in my community who don't necessarily have an academic background to even be able to understand this book, which was like high academic stuff. And then I um, thought to myself, but it's so valid. It's still so important, this book. And maybe I can reach more people if I communicate it differently. So this was one of my Afrofuturist visions that I had uh, along the line, where I was like, yeah, what would have happened if Audre Lorde, uh, Maya Yim and W.E.B. Du Bois met in space where they are now? And then I imagined what their conversation would be. What would they actually be talking about? Because there are so many parallels in the lives of these three people when it comes to being a black person in Germany and the experience that they had while living in Germany, that then I then created it into a conversation, taking original quotes, background theories out of my dissertation and just putting it together again. And then out of that, first of all, uh, came a scenic reading, um, which I then performed in, in, in Brazil, in Portuguese, working with an um, Afro-Brazilian percussionist where this whole idea of Afro-culture gained this, um, Afro-Brazilian touch. And then the idea was to create that into a whole stage piece, no? because first of all, it was only a scenic reading. No, and I was like, nah, this has to become, this has to be real, this has to be, we're gonna blow this up for Germany. Now this was like, nah, this is like, ah, nah, you know? And then I get one of my ambitious ideas and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then <laughs> when, um, when, <laughs> when the theater in Dusseldorf, the Schauspielhaus asked me to um, do something, I was like, you know what, I've got something for you, no? I, this is what I want to do. And they loved the idea. And so, so we started and then uh, started working on it last year. And then Corona came around the corner, Ms. Rona ruined everything for everybody. And so um, it's been postponed to next year. But the idea behind it is now is that we've, we've um, out of the Senate reading, we've created a, a, a theater play 
um, with the same three protagonists in conversation with each other, but more in not only just reading, but in motion with each other also. And um, we're working with a, a European classic ensemble, uh, the Viachi Piu, um, who is um, to, to capture this the, the German idea of music. Although I would say classic music is black music, yeah. Because, you know, Be Beethoven was black, you know? Oh, people don't like hearing that, but all black music is, is all music is black music anyway. So um, the whole piece then gets this European, um, European Afro touch. I don't know how to go. Well, it's Afro culture, but in German, in German, Afro German Afro culture. Afro -pian. And, um, Afro there you go. <laughs> That's a word that I was missing. And I'm looking so forward to being back on stage when this whole Corona thing is, well, it's never going to be over, but when we, um, you know, can enter the new normal, let's put it that way, then um, that's uh, that's the project. That's what's on for, for next year. And I think the beautiful thing about it is that working this time, not only with two languages, but three, that, that was just topped off. It was another icing on the cake for me, just really to bring our story, not only to our own people, not only to the white majority society here in Germany, but also to, to transport uh, and, and translate black German history to the world and becoming a part of the diaspora, a very valid and on eye level with all these other cultures that are so strong in the diaspora, in our little community, Germany, just peeking up through them and saying, yeah, hey, wait a minute, we're there too. Don't forget us, no? You're not going yes. to the future without us. No? Absolutely, so. and and also the Afro-Brazil community actually is another community that haven't been in focus, uh, in focus a lot because most of the time when we speak about, speak about African community, we mostly talk about people coming directly from Africa, then maybe from the States, Afro-Americans, but then there's a whole other uh, context of like Afri African people all over in Southern America, in, you know, Middle America, like, and that hasn't been in focus. So that brings in a whole different aspect that I think um, a lot of people are not aware of and familiar with inside the black community but also outside the black community so thank you so much for uh giving us a actually little next year there will be a trilingual book as well because i'm not going to miss documenting it so um you can look forward to the book yes. coming with the play as well it's got all three languages in it all three plays in english yes. german and portuguese that's amazing uh, we have definitely something to look forward to. I know a few other things that are in the making uh, on your side. So uh, we will have all your social media website or whatever underneath here. So you can uh, follow Natasha and find all the resources and see what's happening and when the next releases are. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, for giving so much insight explaining certain structures and things that um, have been not understood till today, I would say, and where we all, all, I'm always including myself, need to dig deeper, you know, and search for things that have been said, not just decades ago, but centuries ago, people have been saying the same things and even very, um, insightful and um, advanced, you know, we call it all advanced, but it has been said 100 years ago, something that is very helpful for us today. So thank you for sharing, sharing the, your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise, and for um, being so inspiring to me and to many. And uh, now I ask you to yell something to us, please. Freedom! Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining in to episode number 10, special episode with um, in partnership with Goethe Institute Toronto and Goethe Institute Montreal. Please keep on supporting, subscribe to Yell It, and join the next show. will be coming up Tuesday. Um, the next show will be in December. And I wish you all a wonderful night or afternoon um, and see you soon. Bye. Yell it, yell it, yell it, yell it, yell it from the mountain.